Something pretty important happened last year. Chinese giant BYD overtook Tesla as the world's largest producer of electric vehicles. Now that's a global stat, but BYD is making huge inroads here in Australia. So is the unusually named SEAL the car to finally topple the mighty Model 3? Well, it's not gonna be an easy task for, as you can see, the Tesla has just undergone a sizable facelift. So my job here is simple. Tell you all about the Tesla and find out where the SEAL is better, where it's the same and where it falls short. Hit the time codes below if you wanna skip ahead and like and subscribe while you're at it. Let's get into it. It's not difficult to figure out why we're putting these two together. They're both electric four-door sedans that cost around 60 grand before on-roads, give or take a couple of thousand dollars. The Tesla's closer to 65 grand as tested thanks to the red paint and 19-inch alloy wheels, whereas the BYD is standard. In fact, the only option you can get on a SEAL is $1,500 for an ocean blue interior. It's surely not controversial to say that Tesla has improved the looks of the Model 3 with its recent update. There's even a strong hint of Aston Martin around the lights and front guards, so that can't be a bad thing, can it? The seal is slightly narrower, but slightly longer in both length and wheelbase than the Tesla. Both look like they could be hatchback, but are in fact traditional sedans. The BYD is also, to these eyes at least, a pretty handsome one too. Propulsion systems are very similar. Rear wheel drive, about six seconds to 100. The BYD is more powerful, but the Tesla is almost 300 kilograms lighter. Both cars claim more than 500 kilometers of range, but the BYD has the clear advantage, with the SEAL Premium claiming 570 k's, the most of any variant, whereas the Model 3 makes do with 513. In terms of charging, the Tesla has the edge with a maximum DC rate of 170 kilowatts to the BYD's 150 kilowatts. But both these rates should see you top up from 10 to 80% in around 30 minutes, but both will take a long, long time on a typical AC outlet. Both manufacturers fall short in terms of warranty provision, but for different reasons. Tesla's is shorter than the industry standard, but while BYD's looks decent, some parts of the car are only covered for three or four years, so it definitely pays to read the fine print. Starting in the Tesla, and at first glance, it looks like not much has changed, but as ever, the devil is in the detail. There's a lot to cover, so I'll go through it bit by bit. It's more minimalist than ever before as Tesla has eradicated the column stalks. The indicators are now on the steering wheel and the gear selector is in the screen. Yep, really, you swipe up for drive and down for reverse. The changes are hit and miss. The gear selector actually works really, really well. It's super quick and easy, albeit a bit different. The biggest problem is getting over the conditioning of pulling back for drive and pushing forward for reverse that you'd normally do. The indicators are less successful. I don't mind indicators on the steering wheel, you get used to it pretty quickly, but the problem here is that they're stacked on top of one another rather than being side by side. So if you invert the wheel, you've got to figure out the x-axis and the y-axis. Even when driving normally, I've occasionally hit the wrong one in a rush, and I don't think that would happen if they were sitting side by side. So it's better than ever, but also feels nicer than ever. I think material quality at this price point is absolutely fine and the new ambient lighting accentuates the design which really reminds me of the Jaguar XK. There's masses of storage, Tesla is peerless when it comes to taking advantage of EV space efficiency and the USB-C ports front and rear are now 65 watt not 15 watt. There's also stacks of kit, keyless entry via smart card or phone, heated and ventilated electric seats, heated steering wheel, triple zone climate control, double glazed windows, front and rear, and more sound deadening, but more on that later. All right, Tesla's pièce de résistance, the central screen. It's new, slimmer than before, as well as brighter and more responsive, and it's so far ahead of any other manufacturer's infotainment, it's not even funny. Put it this way, usually the first thing we mention is whether a car has smartphone mirroring because it's usually better than using a car's native system, but this doesn't really need smartphone mirroring because it's, well, better. Yes, the breadth of it is slightly intimidating, but you hop in, use QR codes to connect your Apple accounts and your Spotify. The sat nav is incredible, so detailed and fast and easy to put in addresses. Though saying that, on the way to location this morning, it did think I was driving in Port Phillip Bay the whole time, so there are a couple of bugs still to work out. There's heaps of vehicle controls, obviously, but it's all pretty easily navigated. I'm not exactly the most technologically astute person around, but 
find it all fairly intuitive. Possibly the biggest bugbear is having to always go into the climate screen to adjust fan speed, and the voice control can be a bit dodgy too. The seal is a lot more conventional. We've got a start-stop button, and a gear lever, and column stalks, and an instrument display, and a traditional centre console. Well, it's just like a car, really. As such, there's nothing to get used to, and like the Tesla, it's very well equipped. Heated and ventilated electric seats, head-up display, 12-speaker stereo, dual-zone climate, pair of wireless charging pads. Likewise, for the money, this is a very nice cabin in terms of the materials used, a bit of design flair without being weird like the Addo 3 SUV. Good driving position, it all just works. There's not quite as much storage as in the Tesla, but there's still this big area down here under the center console, which is great for odds and ends, and perfect to store a handbag, or so I'm told. The screen looks very similar to the Tesla's, but it's not quite as slick in its execution. It's not bad and gets better once you figure out some of its idiosyncrasies. I'll give you a couple of examples. The default screen is this, which isn't super helpful, but swipe left and you get many more functions. Likewise, swipe down and you get instant access to commonly used controls. You can expand the vehicle control list or set up shortcuts. But even so, it's just not quite as intuitive. I'll give you one very small example. To set up Spotify in the Tesla, you use a QR code, it takes five seconds. Whereas in the BYD, you have to use your email and password. Do you know your Spotify password? Because I sure don't. One advantage is the existence of smartphone mirroring, wired Apple CarPlay and wireless Android Auto, or to really impress your friends, you can always change the orientation of the screen. All in all, while the BYD has more ticks and works well enough in its own right, it's the Tesla that has the superior infotainment system. Not just to the BYD, to just about everything. Hop in the back of the Tesla and there's ample room, though headroom could be a bit tight, and all the usual amenities. USB-C ports, fold down centre armrest, air vents, but the real party trick is the extra screen. It basically mirrors the entertainment functions of the front screen, so you can play games, watch Netflix or YouTube and the like, as well as control the ventilation, the heated rear seats, and move the front passenger seat. On the face of it, it's a good way to keep the kids entertained, but having them look down from their seats probably isn't ideal. If you've got two kids back here, I can see it starting as many arguments as it solves. Still, neat bit of tech. Say, I love the new Canes interior. Ha, love this guy. The seal has the same wheelbase as an Audi A6, which is partly responsible for the absolutely immense amount of legroom in here. Honestly, it's like a limo. Headroom is a little bit tighter, you probably wouldn't want to be much taller than me, but material quality carries over from the front, and it's actually really impressive. It doesn't just turn into a sea of hard plastic like in so many other cars. There aren't as many toys in the BYD, just USB ports, cup holders and the fold down centre armrest, but it's quite an impressive space as far as rear seats go. Even for five, as the flat floor means the centre pew still has plenty of legroom. Both the BYD and the Tesla have all the active safety gizmos you'd expect, though equally, the calibration in each could use some further tweaking. But more on that when we get behind the wheel. Both cars have decent sized boots with extra storage under the floor and in the nose, but the Tesla has more space at both ends and, again, really makes the most of that EV packaging. As a static object, the Tesla is pretty remarkable and holds the advantage over the BYD. But these are cars, so I must drive them. Tesla doesn't often get enough credit for how well its cars drive, certainly in the case of the Model 3 anyway. Look, I'm not saying it's staggering or anything, but it's way, way better than it could or perhaps even needs to be. Especially when you consider Tesla is basically a tech company that makes cars. Clearly, there are some very, very talented automotive engineers working behind the scenes. The big focus for the facelifted Model 3 was improving comfort, and it has worked. The tyres have been tweaked, there are now frequency selective dampers, which are kind of adaptive, but also not really, but they work well, and lots of extra sound deadening. Now, for some reason, Tesla's always been considered a luxury brand, and to be honest, I think that's still a bit of a stretch, but this now feels like a premium product. Certainly the ride and refinement definitely justify that label. The super quick steering won't be for everyone. I know my colleague Sam Charwood isn't a huge fan, for instance, but I have no problem with it. The weighting is really good, and there's even a bit of texture to it now. No longer just feels like you're driving a video game. 
It's super smooth, surprisingly quick, with incredible response. Vision is fantastic thanks to the super low scuttle. It's just a great car for the urban environment. A couple of issues are the lack of head-up display. It's not a huge deal, but having to constantly check the center screen for your speed isn't ideal. And I'd love to be able to manually adjust the level of regenerative braking. Also, the driver assist systems are in general okay, but the Model 3 does love a phantom collision warning, and the lane assist can be up for the occasional wrestle as well. But hold that thought. The Chinese car makers are often referred to as the new Koreans. The likes of Hyundai and Kia started off offering cheap and not especially cheerful vehicles, but over the course of a couple of decades, we end up with class leading products. It's not quite an accurate comparison though, as the rate of improvement for the Chinese is much, much faster. The seal is good. Not incredible, not class leading necessarily, but certainly good enough that I think that most buyers will be pleased with what they've bought. In many ways, the BYD feels similar to the Tesla. Performance is about the same, which is to say ample with excellent response. And while the ride probably isn't as controlled and is also a little bit more reactive, in general, this is an easy, comfortable and relaxing car to drive. Around town where electric cars are at their most efficient, both the BYD and Tesla display impressive consumption numbers, suggesting that 500 kilometers or more of real world range is definitely achievable. There are a couple of issues with the BYD, however. The first is a relatively minor one. Occasionally, especially at speed, the steering just feels a bit solid, like there's too much resistance in the system. But the second is a major one. The driver assist systems reacting violently to scenarios they really should ignore. On multiple occasions, driving on a two-way road, oncoming traffic has spooked the car and caused it to aggressively turn left. Likewise, if you wander in your lane slightly, it doesn't so much give you a nudge as an almighty push. It's very unpleasant, and if you're unaccustomed or unaware of such systems, it could very well make a situation more dangerous. And it's a shame, because otherwise, there's a lot to like about the SEAL. Both these cars are a sign of how quickly EVs have developed. Both are roomy, drive well, have extensive feature lists and heaps of range for around $60,000, giving them essentially price parity against petrol competitors. There is a clear winner though, and it's not the SEAL. Now it is a good car, and if you want one, you're unlikely to be disappointed. And if you do want one, the premium is the one to get, as it's better than the faster, but less resolved performance. Its traditional feel may also bring comfort to those who find Tesla's way of doing things a bit too much. If you can accept the Model 3's quirks though, it is a fantastic car. The original Model 3 was a very good electric car, which is why, along with its Model Y sibling, it became the dominant sales force, but the new one improves it in almost every area. It's great to drive, incredible value, and the EV benchmark which everyone else must continue to try and match. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe to the Car Sales channel, and give us a comment down below with the cars you'd like to see us compare.